All right, so first of all, I want to congratulate all my classmates for doing their senior project. I'm one of the last ones. It's been such a great experience. Thank you, Mrs. Chill. Thank you, panel. It's been really great. I'm really excited to share with you what I've been doing. Um, so, welcome to my senior project. My name is Michael Matias. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about human behavior. And more specifically, about why we make consistently irrational decisions that we often take for granted as being correct. And I'm going to start with a short example. So we all know the scenario in which we walk into a store, we see a bunch of products on the shelf, and we, they have different quality and different prices, and we have to decide which one to purchase. And we often do this calculation in our mind very, very quickly. And research shows that most consumers purposely avoid the most expensive option, they also avoid the cheapest option, most opt for the, sorry, most opt for the $27 bottle of wine. Now smart retailers realize this consumer behavior and they add an extra expensive item on the very end of the aisle, which, and all of a sudden, most consumers purchase the $33 bottle of wine. This is a problem because of shifting comparisons. Because when we get home and crack open the bottle of wine, we don't care about what it was standing next to. We evaluate it solely based on the quality of the wine and how much we purchased for it. So if before we were only willing to pay $27 for a bottle, the same should apply regardless of what other products are on the shelf. And I'm sure most, many of you know the show Modern Family. I love the show. It's a show about a very irrational family. The husband, Phil, is especially irrational. Here's just another example. I don't always make great decisions under pressure. What the hell is that? An alpaca. I got the last one. <laughs> right? Again, this is another form of, I don't always make great another form of sorry, irrational decision. Most likely there was only one alpaca to start with, but because there was one left, he automatically assumed that it was, uh, that it, it was a good uh, price to pay. And these examples led me to my overall research question, which asks, what are the different irrationalities that we face in our daily lives? What are the impacts worldwide, and is there even a way to tackle them? And it all started in the 18th century with economist Daniel Bernoulli, who asked himself the very interesting question, how do we as humans know what to do, exactly what to do, at all possible times? How do we know that what we're doing all the time is correct? How do we have, how are we so uh, conscious of what we're doing? How do we know when to wake up, what to eat for breakfast, when to go to school, what homework to do, what to pay, what to do, whatever? How do we have so much confidence in ourselves that these decisions are correct? And he came up with this slightly complicated formula, which he calls the expected, the expected utility theory. And he truly believed that this formula encompasses all human behavior in regards to economic decision making. Lucky for us, in the 20th century, we had economists emerge who, uh, who simplified the formula a bit for us. And they said that the formula claims that the expected gain of an action, the expected gain of what we do, is equivalent to the odds of that, to the odds of achieving what we want, multiplied by the value of what we're getting. In other words, uh, the gain that we're going to get equals to the odds of gaining it times the value. And in the past 40 years, we have, we have numerous economists who emerged and they're aiming to merge the fields of psychology and economics into one. They're showing how this expected utility theory that for centuries people believed to be correct is not, is not accurate in describing how humans react in, in different situations. And previously, rationality was known to be that it's a universal term that we pay, that we get the best product for the best price. But these scientists are saying that no, rationality is differs from person to person. It actually states that we are consistent with our own personal desires. So even though if I'm willing to, if Shubham is willing to pay $5 for a bottle of chocolate milk and I'm willing to pay seven, I'm not irrational because I value that chocolate milk more than he does. And I'm gonna be sharing with you a, a couple of biases that are affecting us that I thought were the most interesting in my research. And the first one is the change bias. And this bias states that we are, that our emotions constantly affect the way we make uh, irrational economic decisions. So even though we're facing equivalent scenarios, financially speaking, our emotions get ahead of us and cause us to make poor choices. So in the first scenario, we choose to go see a Broadway show, we decide to go see The Lion King, and we know that a ticket costs $10. So we put some money in our wallet, we walk to the theater, but when we get there, we lost our $10. The question remains, what do we do now? Do we purchase another ticket? And you may say to yourself, yes, of course, Ten dollars, that's nothing, uh, I, want to, I still want to see the show, there's no correlation. And indeed, you're right, 
88% of the people agree with you that they would purchase another ticket. 12% said they wouldn't. But in the second scenario, which is financially equivalent, we bought a ticket ahead of time, we printed it at home, we're on the way to the theater, and we lost it. When we get to the theater, the cashier asks us, are you willing to pay another $10 for a ticket? All of a sudden, 54% of people said, no, I would not. And only 46% of people said, yes, I would. Now, this is obviously irrational, because financially speaking, the two numbers are equivalent. In both scenarios, you lose $10, and you pay an aggregate of $20 for the, for the ticket of the show. It shouldn't, matter, it shouldn't matter to us how we lost the money. What should matter is how much we're losing and whether we're willing to pay for it again. The second bias is the availability bias, which is responsible for tricking us into thinking that certain events are more or less likely than they actually are. And we're being constantly empowered, we're being constantly forced to think that some things are likely or not based on media and social media and gossip and, and uh, <laughs> journals and magazines that it's, all, that it's become very hard for us to rationally estimate if something is likely or not. One example is the news. They keep, we keep seeing newspaper articles about tornado ravages city or another man killed by, bitten by a shark and killed. We very rarely see a newspaper article about another kid who drowns or, or somebody dying of asthma. So when people were asked to estimate how many people die from different causes, these were the numbers. In reality, these are the figures. And there's an obvious discrepancy between the, actual, between the actual number of deaths and the estimations. People greatly overestimate the, the number of deaths by tornadoes and underestimate the number of deaths by drowning. Again, because it's very easy to recall a newspaper article about tornado ravages a city, it's very hard for us to recall an article about another kid who drowns at the pool. And thirdly, Dan Ariely, a professor from Duke University, a behavioral economist, asks a very interesting question, which is, why do some people, why are some people very generous with donating organs and some are not? And obviously this is a very moral question, it's very ethical, we have to look inside us, do we really want to give our organs after we die or get injured? And he investigated the causes a little bit further and he noticed that uh, the option to become organ donors starts at the DMV. So when we get our license, we have a form and at the end of the form, there's a little checkbox that asks us, would you like to become an organ donor? And there, he found that there are two distinct forms to this. In one, one form said, yes, I would like to be an organ, so you check the box if you want to and listen to the program. A separate form said, no, I would not like to become an organ donor, and you were supposed to check the box for that. So you would be thinking to yourself that the simple action of checking a box shouldn't make a big difference on people's decision. This is a very moral, very heavy decision. Do we donate our organs? It turns out that this has a dramatic impact. When people were asked to check the box to become donors, only 10% did. But when people were asked to leave the box blank to stay donors, over 98% of the people kept the box unchecked and became donors. Then Ariali saw these figures and he said, let's take this one step further. Let's see if there is some, some pattern between countries who employ these different tactics. And you see all the countries in yellow, in gold, these are countries who employ the opt-in method, check the box to become donors, and they average a 10% uh, donation rate. Whereas all the other countries in blue in Europe, they have an opt-out option, check the box if you would not like to become a donor, and over 98% of the population become organ donors. And obviously this is a very important decision. Countries are lacking organs. When a person is dying and needs organs, this decision can mean life and death for them. And it just shows you how one simple word in a sentence can dramatically influence a person's decision. Whether it's something very minuscule or something as moral, as moral and ethic as donating your own organs. And one of the biggest components of my research was to actually go out there and speak to these economists. Speak to the people who I'm basing most of my research on. So I had two great uh, video chats with Daniel Gilbert and Dan Ariely. I also visited the IDC. Uh, University in Herzliya. With Tzachi and Dora, I spoke a lot about fears and anxiety of people. How evolution trains us, trains our habits to become very fearful, of, very fearful of certain things and very cautious of others. And he claims that one of the reasons we're so, we're so, uh, these biases are forced upon us is because of hardwired patterns. Through evolution, we've developed these means of, 
of getting, taking these biases and acting based on them. And I'm, and I'm going to talk a bit about later about how we can tackle these biases, and I'm basing a lot of my claims on my discussion with him. With Dr. Ayal Shahar, I spoke a lot about cheating tendencies, and why, do, why some students choose to cheat more than others, and to what extent. And next month, I'm going to be conducting an experiment with him at an Israeli school to test what can teachers do on the test paper to, to uh, raise the honesty level in students and decrease their cheating habits. With Dr. Ariely and Professor Gilbert, I had two very interesting uh, discussions with them. One was on what are the big impacts of these irrational decisions? I mean, yeah, we are paying a couple more bucks for a wine bottle where, where we're not going to go see the show, we are going to go see the show, but who cares? I mean, it's personal decisions. It turns out that a lot of people care. Global warming, for example, one of the root causes of global warming is that we don't do anything about it. We know that our, that our environment is deteriorating. We know that what we're doing is bad, yet we're not taking enough action to change what we're doing. Because human tendency, based on the term hyperbolic discounting, is that humans tend to neglect future pains, future consequences, and focus on immediate pleasure, on immediate gratification. So people are saying to themselves, ah, let our future generations worry about that, let's, cons let's continue to consume these fuels. The stock market is another example of, um, of how emotions are getting the best of us. A recent experiment was done to ask investors, how did the stock market react after the 2008 crash? For those of you who don't know, in 2008, there was a major uh, recession in the United States, and uh, the S&P 500 index went down 30%. And over 56% of investors said that they remember that the stock market continued to go down at a steady rate. In reality, the stock market boomed by 43%. Now these sm yet small yet large misconceptions shape our economy, they shape the world, and they shape the way we live. And if we continue making them, it's a big problem. And the second question that I discussed with these professors is, what can we actually do to modify the environment? What can we do ourselves to tackle these biases? And they were a bit pessimistic. They said that there's actually not much that we can do. Because these are such hardwired patterns within us, we don't really have an option to train ourselves in the long term to tackle and avoid these biases. What we can do, however, is change the environment around us so that, we are, so that when we come to this, when we, when we get to the point where we have the option to make an irrational choice, we completely avoid it. And I thought about this some more, and I was, I was thinking about a project that I'm working on on my own, and I decided that why don't I start implementing some things that I'm learning from senior project into my own, into an iPhone application that I'm creating. So AnyMeal is a mobile application that helps people with diets, with dietary restrictions, find foods that are good for them. So if you're gluten-free or vegan, we filter restaurants and dishes for you. And one of the key questions that we ask ourselves is, how do we differentiate ourselves from all the other food apps that are on the market? You have dozens of other apps right on the App Store, right on the App Store. they already have great traction, they have a lot of users. Why would people download any meal and not Yelp or Grubhub? <coughs> and we did some research and we noticed that many of these apps, most of them, cost 99 cents. So when you go into the App Store, you see a variety of apps that are competing with us for 99 cents. And we decided to mark ours as free to distinguish ourselves. So all of a sudden we're going to be on the right column of the App Store, featured there, and now many more people will be willing to download it for a trial run. Then we realized that we're dealing with a very tight community of people. People with dietary restrictions love to share information, they love to talk to each other, they love to discuss their diets and places that they can go eat. So we partnered with various food bloggers from San Francisco, and though the people with diets who follow these blogs, the next time they go to the app store, due to their availability bias, they're going to be recalling any meal. Thirdly, we were thinking, pretty recently, about what can we do to provide even more value to our customers. So aside from just showing them what many dishes are good for them, how can we help people with diets combat the immediate desires that they may have at the restaurant? We all know that when we go to a restaurant, we tell ourselves, yes, I'm going to eat healthy today, we end up ordering the chocolate cake. And even if you're not willing to admit it, I know you've all experienced this. So I was thinking to myself, what can we do? What ex a little bit of extra information can we place on the app to help people when they're in the immediate desire, immediate gratification moment to avoid that and make a rational choice and get either a salad or a fruit salad? So I sent out three forms to many people 
One was just a plain menu that I created of a salad, a fruit salad, a chocolate cake, and an ice cream. And I asked them, what would you like to eat? Most of them said, I would like either a chocolate cake or ice cream. So I thought, okay, let's give them the calories. Let's show them how many calories they're going to consume. Maybe this will change their mind. So I told them, okay, salad has 300 calories, ice cream has 750 calories. Turns out, doesn't do anything. Still, most people chose to either buy the chocolate cake or ice cream. But then we showed them how much exercise they will have to create in order to burn the fat. And all of a sudden, when we showed people that it would take three and a half hours of jogging to burn the fat gaining from eating an ice cream, many more people chose the fruit salad. And indeed, this was the most effective piece of information that we gave them. Because think about every time you go for a jog, even for 20 minutes, you feel so proud of yourself that you go home and you eat another ding dong. Right? <laughs> but, but in reality, that, that half of that ding dong is already twice more harmful than the 30 minutes of jogging that you had. So you should be much prouder of yourself by not eating the ice cream and choosing the fruit salad than if you were to go and exercise for as much as two hours. And the bottom line is that we are not rational. I showed you, we're not a rational species, but all these, all these biases that are affecting us all the time cause us to make irrational decisions that not only impact us on an individual level, but they impact all those around us. And they impact the world as a whole. But you know what? That's fine. Because at the end of the day, we are the most intelligent species on Earth. We have the distinct ability to predict our future emotions and act upon them. So even if we make a few irrational mistakes here and there, eventually we get to where we need to. And as Miley Cyrus says, everybody makes mistakes, everybody has those days, right? <laughs> and I'm certain that if we continue on the same path that our society has been going on so far, the future looks very bright for us. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed.